We have had a lot of tragedies in this small congregation, and I might say in the extended congregation of the ICG in the last couple, three years. Mrs. Cunningham is gone from among us, and Woody, on the day that he was returning from his marriage, from his wedding, and here I performed the wedding for them right here in this room, for Woody and Juanita, and they go down to, I think, San Antonio, and were on their way home, and it stopped by the road, and he was suddenly struck by a car and killed, and so here I have to go down there about one week later after I perform that wonderful couple's wedding ceremony, I've got to go down and perform one of the saddest funerals that I can imagine. And also perform the funeral of Bill Dunham only a few weeks ago from right here in a congregation from among us. And now Joanne Cumming is gone. Well, all of these people knew the truth about the resurrection and they knew the truth about what is man and what this human life is all about. What I don't understand, and I'm going to highlight that as I go through some of these scriptures with you, is why this absolutely beautiful truth, this comforting truth that ought to give us courage and hope is rejected by the churches. I just don't understand that. I never have, I never will. If you will turn to 1 Corinthians 15, I'll begin in verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, and just about everyone right across the board, and I don't need to mention all of them, more than 400 and some denominations and hundreds of other smaller split schism sects, divisions, and smaller offshoots of an offshoot of an offshoot. So there are probably five or 6,000 of them all over the country who profess the name of Jesus Christ and who profess to believe in God and profess that the Bible is the Word of God. And some of them even say boldly, where the Bible speaks, we speak, and where the Bible is silent, we are silent. Oh, that that were true. And it isn't. So he said, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, and hundreds of millions of people believe that, look what was getting going in the Corinthian congregation way back then. How say some among you, there is no resurrection of the dead. Now you can guarantee that if there were people there to say it, there were people there to believe it. Because that's the way human beings are. Someone starts some kind of a new idea, a doctrine, a rumor of some kind, and, and off you go, and there are followers who will believe that. So Paul is dealing, isn't he, with a group of people in Corinth, a city of about 400,000, where there was a church of a couple of hundred or more people, and he's writing to them about the second letter. He said, I said to you in an earlier letter, so we know that this is the second one that they receive, but it's the only one, the sec first one, rather, that we have in the Bible. He said, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our ministry, our preaching is vain, and your faith is vain. Forget it. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die, because there is no God. Let's just be like Malcolm Muggeridge and some of the British philosophers and other people who claim there is no God, and we're all a bunch of atheists, and we're here like so many animals, and uh, we're just going to live for our short life, and so let's enjoy it to the full while we can, and that's the end of everything. But these are religious people who claim to believe in God and in the resurrection. Yea, and he said, we're found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you're yet in your sins. The whole idea of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that he died and was buried for the sins of the entirety of the world, and that we are saved by his life. Now, if we were saved by his death, then he didn't need to be raised from the dead, did he? If we were saved by his death, people say that we're saved by the blood of Christ. Well, the Bible actually says we're saved by his life. If his death was all that was required, there was no reason for God to raise him. And the, I don't know if there's a church in the world that preaches what Jesus Christ has been doing ever since. What did he do yesterday? What did he do last Tuesday? What was he doing in 1911? What was he doing in 1016? What was he doing in the third century? What has he been doing all this time? Just sitting there? I don't think they have banquets in heaven. I don't think they just eat and drink and enjoy life in the way that we on this earth do. Well, the book of Hebrews answers that question, of course. He is there, busy, 
you know, you, you cannot fathom, your mind simply cannot fathom many things that are developed in modern technology. We grow, well, I didn't. I didn't see a television set until I was about 17. I know that's awful. That, that sounds weird to some of you young people. But I was curious about how that could happen. How could a picture get transmitted through the air? And how can the color, the, all the entire spectra of color, be transmitted? But kids grow up, and they don't run and toddle over behind that television box and look and see how that man get in there. They just take it for granted. They grow up and there it is. Now right now we got these little cell phones and as all of you know that right now, though you cannot see or hear, there are thousands of frequencies that are bombarding this room. And you could dial into thousands of them. If you had a VHS or a VHF or some kind of an LF, MF radio, you could listen to aircraft overhead. You could hear them talking to the final approach controller at Dallas. You could hear them talking to centers that direct air traffic. You could hear ships at sea. I've got a short wave, and I've got all these different things on a feature, uh, features on a radio of mine, and I have fun on a rare occasion. I'll just flip around to different bands, and I'll hear Morse code. I'll hear international code. I'll hear people from the Pacific to the Atlantic talking from ships at sea. So you all know that. But do you understand it? Can you diagram it? Can you explain it to someone else? Do you understand how all of that happens? Now, I'm building up to something here that might help you understand and might not. Today, they can put in a microchip the size of my little fingernail the information that used to be contained in file drawers and cabinets that would absolutely fill this room. And when they send it back and forth, for example, for our satellites, if we wanted to send something to a special forces group operating in Afghanistan, we will send garbage for about 45 minutes. And that garbage will be interrupted only about, oh, 10 times or so by about a two-second pause, and it's called a microburst. And what they will do is take a message, and then they will, with their code machines, convert that message into cryptographs, little five-block figures. And those five-block figures will then be condensed into little sounds like beep, 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 like your telephone, except so incredibly rapidly than what is called a microburst of just a flash of sound, and it's just like our tape duplicator. We take tapes, we stick it in a tape duplicator, and it's not played at real time, it doesn't play for 30 minutes. It just goes real fast. Well, the same thing is happening in this microburst of code that goes from a satellite down to our special forces. And they just receive a lot of meaningless sounds on tape. Then they take it in and they play it at a different speed, and finally they get the cryptographs and then the, crypto, uh, the uh, translator, the people who translate it and deal with it, take it in there and play it at the right speed so they get the characters and then they take it in to the general or the colonel and tell him what the message was all about. Now, I'm building up to something. What I'm building up to is how do you understand that Jesus Christ can listen to more than one prayer at the same time? Because you don't know anything at all about the mind of God. We know very little about the human mind. Our minds, believe it or not, most of the time are operating at about two, three, four, five percent capacity. And I can tell you an awful lot of athletes I know about that are operating at 0.01 percent. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the human brain is capable of so much more than we realize, and we don't really use but a part of the capacity that is there. Do you know that, believe it or not, there were Pharisees during Jesus' day who could recite to you the entire book of the Psalms and not miss a single word? Does that boggle your mind? Commit to memory, in Hebrew, the entire book of Psalms and never miss it. And they did it in meter. So, I mean, I just am in awe of the capacity of the human mind. Now, since God is the designer of the human mind, and God's mind is so vastly superior to ours, it doesn't boggle my mind at all. When I think of all the prayers here and there around the world that are going up to Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, to interfere when he needs to, and to be an intercessor to convey our prayers to God the Father, and that he is like, say, an executive vice president at the throne, 
who administers everything that God tells him to do. And the book of Hebrews deals with that, that he is busy. He doesn't sleep, doesn't grow tired, because someone is awake on the world all the time as it rolls around. We don't call it earth roll, we call it sunrise and sunset. And Almighty God is hearing the prayers of our brethren in Australia. I think that's obvious because the calls are coming in at the rate of about $6 per call. Uh, we had 82 calls last week, and I'm happy to announce that. The people down there were very, very uh, pleased and excited about that. So it looks like we're off and running in Australia, and I will appeal to people to keep that in mind because we certainly don't want to have to cancel it. Well, let's go on with a little of this. Since by man, verse 21, came death, and that's going back to original sin, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, all die. Now, we all know that. Nothing is surer than death or taxes. When I was 16, that was just so far off. The possibility of that was so far off in the future that it was just like I had about 14 lifetimes of 100 years of peace to live before anything like that would ever be contemplated. I do find that when people get older, they contemplate serious questions about life and about what happens when they die a lot more than we tend to when we're young and full of vim, vigor, and vitality, as we say. But every man in his own order. He says, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Now you tell me if the churches, all of them, you can mention all the names, believe this or not. Christ the first fruits, afterward, does that mean what it says? Afterward? Oh, well, that's good. I'm, we got a positive answer. The word afterward means after. Well, that's nice. That, that's great. Afterward, they that are Christ's. Who are those? Converted Christian people. At his coming. Oh, then nobody has gone up to heaven yet. Well, then why do hundreds of millions of people think they have? Because they won't read this scripture because I have never been to a funeral in my life, and I've been to quite a number of them. I had to perform dozens of them, I suppose, and I've been to quite a number in other churches. I went to one at a leading Methodist church here in Tyler, Texas, not that long ago. They had a female minister, quote-unquote, up there, who read uh, the 23rd Psalm. Uh, they had some little mention, I think, was made of the deceased, but not much, not much of a personal nature. Uh, they recited the Lord's Prayer together. They sang a bunch of songs together. There was not one scripture that dealt with the resurrection of the dead. They didn't even open to 1 Corinthians 15, didn't quote a single verse from it. They avoid it like the plague. That's strange because the truth of God is so comforting and it, is, it gives so much courage and faith and hope to people who really understand it. And it's so logical. So why are these beautiful, comforting words just rejected by the churches of the world? Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. It's a bitter enemy. We hate it. It's awful. Another one of the saddest funerals I ever performed was over here in Canton, Texas, when... Uh, Mr. Pierce's grandson, who had been struck by a car when he was driving his motorcycle, he had just come out of a country lane and a woman in a car hit him, and he skidded along the concrete, and they thought he was fine, picked him up in the ambulance and took him, but they didn't know that he had been internally injured and that the, uh, an artery had been broken inside, and he bled to death on the way to the hospital. He was 17. He helped his dad and his grandfather in their, their automobile machine shop. He was one of the most popular kids in that high school. The whole high school turned out. And here on the front row, never forget it, at this beautiful big funeral chapel right there by the graveyard was all of his classmates. And they were going to sing their class song. And at the appropriate time when that was announced, they tried to sing the song and just some little squeaks came out and they all just sat there and cried. And so did I. And I'm up there trying to do the funeral. When people don't know, when they have no hope, when death is just a great big black, hideous, unwanted, horrible thing, it is just something so hard for them to get over that some people don't get over it. 
People have literally committed suicide when they've lost a loved one because they could not bear to live without him or her. Over in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, I've really pounded this into people's minds, but it's because they don't understand what the Bible says. We went right over it real quickly in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 15, but I'll quote it to you as you turn to 1 Thessalonians 4. They which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. They which are fallen asleep. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. I had intended, maybe I'll get around to doing it sometime, I was going to preach about sleep. Because you know, so much of our lives we sleep. And not very well. If I read the statistics in the United States, about 40-50% of us have, and I'm saying us because I have a problem a lot of time, getting to sleep or staying to sleep and wake up at 2 or 3 in the morning and cannot go back to sleep and that kind of thing because you have so many things on your mind and some kind of a theme, some problem, something to be resolved, something left undone will just plague your mind. You lie there and it just same thought goes over and over and over and over and over. Finally you get up and take an Advil or, or an Alka-Seltzer and stagger back to bed and hope that will knock you out and uh, get that thought or that song or that whatever that uh, conflict with somebody else out of your head where you can sleep peacefully. You know, it says that God gives to His beloved sleep. And sleep is a blessing from the Lord, from God. And uh, an awful lot of people don't have that blessing. They don't sleep deep and full. I'll tell you how to sleep really deeply. The best sleep I get any time of the year is in a sleeping bag around 10,000 feet after a hard day stomping up and down the mountains with a rifle in my hand trying to shoot an elk or a deer. And you get up at about 3 or 4 o'clock, eat a great big breakfast of my own recipe, pancakes, and then you stalk around the mountains in your heavy boots and all of that hour after hour, and you come back in that evening and eat a nice meal and crawl into that sleeping bag and it's about maybe 7 degrees outside or something and you're in a little bitty tent. Oh, you talk about deep. I have a big old thick foam mattress that I put under my sleeping bag. Better by far than any bed I've ever had at home or in a, in a motel. Just sleeping in a sleeping bag on a foam mattress. That is the way I ought to just roll it out on the floor, I guess, and do that at home because I'd sleep better, I suppose. So I will not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and you believe that, and I believe that, and every one of these people who died believed it, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, the old King James English word means precede, them which are asleep. Why does the Bible over and over again describe death as a deep, profound sleep where a person is just absolutely out of it and completely unconscious and unaware of the passing of time. Well, because that's what happens. Because that's what death is. And what they don't understand is that we do have a spirit. They have mistakenly called it a soul after people like Epictetus and Plato and Socrates and ancient old philosophers' myths and they think we have an immortal soul which is conscious when it is apart from the body. No, it is not. We have a human spirit which when it is connected with and inside the frontal lobes of your brain and is connected with your brain and is fed and kept alive by the human physical metabolic organism that we are and by the pulsing of blood to the brain, then the two, spirit and brain or spirit and mind, function together. And your spirit is what gives you your personality your character, your decision-making ability. It's what makes you, you. It gives you your emotions. It gives you your, your ability to feel sympathy or empathy for someone. It gives you your, I said character, that is your decision-making capacity to see the difference between right and wrong and to force yourself to choose that which is right instead of that which is wrong. It's where your character resides. Now God will put His Holy Spirit in your brain, your mind, to attach to your spirit. And thus the Bible says, a new creature in Christ, a new spirit is begotten. Christ is called the first begotten among all of mankind from the Father. 
He's called the firstborn among many brethren. He was called in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 15, the first fruits afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So he goes on to say that the coming of the Lord, they will not, those which are alive and remain, and we hope that includes all of us in this room, under the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep, those who have already died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. When does that happen? At the second coming of Christ. It says, every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Three verses before the favorite text of every Protestant and every Catholic, John 3.16, is John 3.13 which says no man is ascended into heaven. But they won't ever even by accident stumble on that one. It's only three verses before the favorite verse that they will hold up in a big bed sheet behind some guy that's about to drive a ball in a golf tournament. I've seen it time and time again, John 3.16. They have a placard and up pops John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not what? I can tell a young Marine, a young sailor, a young Army, a young Air Force, Coast Guardsman what death is. They can tell me what death is. I know what death is. I've seen death. I've held dead people in my arms. I've watched people die. We lost some people in a fiery crash on our flight deck when I was in the Navy. I've seen a lot of dead people, stood by a lot of dead beer, seen my own mother die before my eyes. I know what death is. I've seen people die. And so I could ask any person in the military that's seen a lot of people die, what is death? And they'd tell me the same thing that I would tell them. Now, if you have a whole truckload of perishable fruit, what happens? When you pick it, it is still fresh, but from that instant, it is starting to die, starting to decay. The idea is that you eat it while it's fresh before it dies, before it completely perishes. So they're called perishables. And it says in John 3.16, Whosoever believeth him in him should not perish, but, which is an opposite, on the other hand, have everlasting life. And what do the churches tell you? You've already got everlasting life. That's what Satan said to Eve in the garden. You shall not surely die. God knows better than that. He knows that in the day you partake of that, well, you'd be wise like God is. That was the beginning of the first lie about the immortality of the soul. You shall not surely die. Only the body dies, but you stay alive. You whisk off up to heaven somewhere. So here is the word of God describing human death as a profound sleep. Now, it doesn't matter whether you are one of the dead in Christ or whether you're simply dead. You're still going to be resurrected. And it doesn't matter whether you're one of the dead in Christ or simply dead never having heard the truth, like a Vietnamese or a Chinese baby of six months that died of malnutrition and starvation, or whether you are a rotten, recalcitrant, dirty, egocentric, vicious, perverted, mass murderer who has deliberately rejected the truth of God, who heard it and knew it, and is so absolutely determined to be a satanic, perverted, wretched so-and-so that he will not repent. He is also going to be resurrected. But in Luke's version of the parable that Jesus Christ gave of Lazarus and the rich man, the rich man characterizes the incorrigible wicked who are also lying there in their grave. Now, people could argue forever whether or not a guy like Joseph Stalin or Pol Pot, who murdered a million people, or Adolf Hitler, who murdered, was actually responsible for the murder of more than 70 million people, 30 million in Russia alone, 6 million Jews murdered. We had about a million uh, casualties, that included wounded, not anywhere near the likes of many other nations in World War II. And these people are guilty of mass murder on a scale that boggles the mind. And people could argue, well, do you think they're ever going to be forgiven? Can they ever be forgiven? I don't even want to deal with that. That's, thankfully, uh, in the province of God. God will deal with that in his good time. But they are also going to come up in a resurrection. Now Judas Iscariot typifies what I think is going to happen to some of these people, at least what their minds will begin doing to them. Finally, when just like suddenly feeling that he wasn't 
possessed of all these evil intentions and evil motives, the determination that he had, the anger that he had, the hatred that he had, the fact that he was a rotten thief, he was a sneak thief, he was the business manager under Jesus, he held the bag, he was stealing, and so on from him. It all just left him when the devil left him, and the devil left him like a hollow shell. And suddenly it came to him what he had done, and he couldn't live with himself. He hated himself at that moment, and so he went out and hung himself. He first of all tried to undo it all by taking the 30 pieces of silver and took it back to the high priest, and they said, you take care of that, we've already done this deal, we paid you, that's yours. So he took it and just threw it out there in the potter's field, like he's trying to get rid of it, and then he went and he hung himself. And I think that when some of these people come up and are faced, and I know I've, I've Maybe you can say this is just my fantasy, but I really think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, nothing is more incredibly instructive than seeing audio visual at the same, visual at the same time. I mean, once television and motion pictures were invented and developed, it was one of the most fantastic things for training people and the impact of it, and of course perverting people as well, that you could imagine. You see better and, and uh, get things through the eye than you do through the ear. Just listening is nowhere near as important as reading. But when you get them both, when you see and you hear, and it can be in special effects, like you're actually seeing the explosion, you're seeing the, the uh, building approaching, you're seeing the airplane going now, whatever. And you know how I'll be sitting there watching a news program, and several seconds of some kind of a preview of a movie will come on. And I mean, here are just vast explosions and bodies flying and machine guns going, and one is called Witchblade, all kinds of knives and that stuff. Now, having said that, since the Apostle Paul had an out-of-the-body experience, and he was taken to the third heaven where he heard things that a man is not supposed to hear, and he actually saw and heard just like he was alive all of these things, why could not God, in the judgment, take a person and put him or her right back in the real life situation of sin in which they dwelt and just recreate it for them. I mean, reminding them of what they did is one thing, but letting them absolutely be there in front of God and the angels doing it is something else, isn't it? So it makes me wonder, I know God has that power, for someone who will not repent of evil deeds that they have done to actually have God take them in the mind's eye, in spirit, back, and in real time, not in special effects, recreate the situation for them. Seems to me like that would be the most powerful witness against sin because, you know, people, it says men love darkness because their deeds are evil. And I think that God may just use such a technique and it will certainly break an awful lot of, I think, recalcitrant necks and hard hearts and cause a lot of people to become converted who otherwise wouldn't be. Now go on with this in 1 Thessalonians 4, in verse 16, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. When? When Christ comes, and not a moment before. In the clouds. Where do the clouds form? In the lower atmosphere, below the troposphere, basically. I mean, I used to get the Met reports, and I used to fly over most of the weather, except the equatorial Africa. You'd see them going up to 55, 60,000 feet. You couldn't get over those. But a lot of the 35, 40,000 feet bumpers, we'd get over them very easily in the Falcon Jet or the G2. I can go up 41, 43, and I've been at 45,000 feet. So you get over the weather. So in other words, I've been a lot higher than the average cloud, including some very large thunderstorms. Now clouds form in, a vision, in the atmosphere, and Christ is coming with clouds. He went and he was assumed up in a cloud. A cloud concealed him, and the first message that ever came back, Acts the first chapter, you men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. So he's coming down to the earth where the clouds form. Now, for comparison, a desk-sized globe about this big, sitting on your desk with a lacquer finish on it, a nice lacquer finish so it's polished and won't show stains and all of that, the lacquer 
is far thicker than the atmosphere covering the earth. The lacquer, the finished coat of lacquer, is thicker than actually the atmosphere in which meteorites burn up. That's just for comparison. If you took a cue ball, as smooth as it is, and you enlarged it to be the size of the earth, the tiny little scratches and imperfections and striations would be so steep and so big and so foreboding and so awesome, they would be far bigger than Mount Everest, far bigger than any mountain chain that you can imagine because of the comparable, the comparable comparative sizes. So I'm just doing this so you get an idea here. Now, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is going to come back and catch up people in the clouds. How far away from the earth do they go? Do they go to heaven? No, there are three heavens mentioned in the Bible, the heaven where the birds fly, and that's where the clouds form. And then the heavens, it is the universe that we see all the stars out there, billions of them in our Milky Way and other galaxies. And then the third heaven, which is mentioned in 2 Corinthians, the third heaven, which is where God's throne is, which may be far beyond that. It is going to boggle your mind, and you can't deal with the fact that you, right this instant, are sitting in the center of the universe. You're sitting in the center of the universe. The universe extends equidistant in every direction away from you forever and ever and ever. Can't deal with that, can you? Because we see straight walls. We see what's called techo in Spanish. We see the silla. We see the floor, the, the ceiling, and the walls. We see things that are uh, understandable. We know how far, how big. We see a picture when we're in the second grade of a mouse and an elephant and a man. We, we compare things humanly and physically. But our minds are just like they have a governor on them. They go just so far and they just bang against that wall. And they can't penetrate that wall any more than your vision can. And so the idea that there is something that is forever, or that goes on forever and ever and ever, is just fathomless. It's impossible for you to grasp. But it happens to be true. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. Now we have flying cars way back when, when they had flubber. They got flying people in movies. They had a nun that had this costume. Big wind came up. She flew around with her hat on, the flying nun. They got Peter Pan, they got all these people in special effects flying around. And they think nothing of that to go to a movie, isn't that fun? Here's this guy, they got one coming out now, you talk about stupid. They got a movie coming out called Spider-Man. <laughs> this guy, I guess, spits out a web and covers a whole building and swings around and just saves the world from tyrants and all of that. They had Superman, now they got Spider-Man. He's called Arachnid, I guess, I don't know. Maybe that's his nickname, Arachnid the Spider-Man. Unbelievable. But here the Bible talks about people being caught up in the air. And that's just so much spiritual gobbledygook to most people. They don't believe it, don't accept it, don't understand it. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. Well, where will the Lord be? He's already come down so far that he's beneath the lacquer on your desk-sized globe. What kind of a trip is it from the third heaven, clear through the universe, past millions of galaxies, all the way to the little corner of the Milky Way galaxy, to this little Earth, which is a tiny little blue, white, and green planet held in the velvety grasp of the sun. And he comes down, and it says in Zechariah 14.4, in that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. His disciples were standing on the Mount of Olives, and his feet left the Mount of Olives. And the first message that ever came back from heaven said he's coming back to stand on the Mount of Olives. And the Bible says he's going to stand in that day on the Mount of Olives. Why don't the churches believe it? I don't know. I haven't a clue. I don't know what's wrong with some of these theologians, what they teach in their dumb seminaries. They've got to avoid, like the plague, some of the most important, some of the most comforting, encouraging, plain, beautiful scriptures in the entirety of the Bible. And they just teach some little smorgasbords of certain little scriptures, little twists they put on them, 
And then once they're equipped with all of that, they're kind of like the salesman. They got the package, may not believe in the product, never use it, wouldn't buy it if they had the money. But they go out and try to sell it to other people. And that's the way these people are. They're like blind guides. They don't want to wander off to get eaten by a tiger somewhere. They know where all the trails are in the Bible. But if they wander around and get into some unfamiliar territory, they'll break out in a cold sweat. I've told on television, and I can tell you this would be true. You know that it's true. If, and these preachers wouldn't dare deny a bereaved person who has lost a wife or a husband or a child. And they go to the funeral parlor, and here's the Methodist, Baptist, Episcopalian, Lutheran, what have you. Preacher is going to be there, and they make a special request. And they just say, Preacher, my special request is that I want you to read and to slowly expound 1 Corinthians 15 over the beer of my departed loved one. You talk about a cold sweat. I mean, they just break out. Oh, well, I, I don't know, Mrs. Jones, whether I could do that or not. You know, you, I just would love to be a fly on the wall hearing what would go on when somebody would say, I want you to expound 1 Corinthians 15 over my loved one. Because they would just be unable to do it. It would just scare them to death. Now, this I want to pass on to you and to everybody hearing this tape. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But it continues right on. Men divided into chapters and verses. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. And that is true of me and you, isn't it? For when they say peace and safety, I hear that all the time. You know what's going on in the Middle East? They told me just today on Fox News once again. Guess what's going on in the Middle East? What all of that is called? It's a peace process. Isn't that unbelievable? They still use that label on all that mayhem and murder, a peace process. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman. Which, oh, did you see, did you see these Palestinians carrying this flag grape coffin running toward Janine, trying to, trying to pretend they're going to put a body in the wreckage for the UN people and dear old Kofi Annan going to come over there with his UN people and investigate this so-called massacre? And they're scurrying along this road, a whole band of Palestinians. And all of a sudden, they drop the coffin, and this guy rolls out. And the guy jumps to his feet and starts to run. And they find out there's an Israeli helicopter with a camera, and here come the police. And so the Palestinians scatter in all directions. They're carrying a live guy, pretending he's dead, in a coffin. And they're going to go in there and claim that it's another, carrying another body away from the massacre the Israelis committed. Oh, it was, it was just, un you talk about caught in the act. I just thought it was incredible. All right, what? When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, and that means intellectually, philosophically, and spiritually. But let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, I know that Mrs. Joanne Cumming died in that hope. The last time that she was being wheeled by, she gave them a thumbs up. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to make it. And I've talked to Chris, as I said, Shirley and I together a couple of times. And, of course, you can even imagine how brokenhearted he is at the moment. But he's not sorrowing, as do others with no hope, because he knows all of this. And Joanne knew all of this. And he had told her that if the worst does come to pass, I'll see you in a few seconds. Actually, a half a second to be closer. But they both understood that. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath. I've got to tell some of these small groups that. There's some small groups around here and there. It sure would be nice if they get the point that God has not appointed us to wrath. Oh well. I can always hope. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at Romans 14, 7 to 9. None of us lives to himself, and it's not talking about symbiosis or the ecosystem. It is really talking about sharing one another's aches and pains and burdens, and it's talking about individual responsibility. 
None of us lives or dies to himself. No man dies to himself. Whether we live, verse 8, and this really is in a chapter, I'm lifting out a paragraph from a chapter that has to do with judging one another. It has to do with some people who think they ought to be vegetarians and other people who think they ought to eat meat and so on, and people judging and condemning and criticizing one another because of different appetites, different things, all of which are allowable in God's Word, as Paul shows very clearly. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to the Lord. We belong to Jesus Christ, alive or dead. Now, is He capable? He's only the one who invented gravity, energy, inertia, who hung the sun up there, a huge helium-hydrogen explosion, a gigantic nuclear furnace, 99.99999% of which is energy escapes into the universe, and 0.000001% of that heat and light and the photons from the sun are stored energy on this earth. Every day's sunlight from the sun is bombarding just this little tiny pinprick of blue-white out here in one corner of the Milky Way. The rest of it is lost. And the ladies' nylons and a pen in my pocket and a lot of the materials we use come from fossil fuels. And our gasoline and our oil and all of our lubricants and, of course, the kerosene, the JP-5 that fuels jet aircraft overhead, comes from fossil fuels. And all that is is an ancient civilization of billions of grunting, squealing, feeding animals called dinosaurs and gigantic rhinoceri and all different kinds of creatures from pterodactyls that had a wingspan the size of a 747. That's a pretty big bird, isn't it? down to little bitty dinosaurs the size of a, of a rabbit. And they're all buried under thousands and thousands of feet of heavy sediment and rock, which is solidified. And we drill down and we find this oil. We find this coal and shale oil. And what we're doing is getting what is called fossil fuel. And it was all created, it was all possible by the rays of the sun, point zero 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 one percent of the energy that sun has put out. I think people don't, don't think in, in terms of God's power. When they read the Bible, they're in the never-never world of churchianity and of piety and of steeples and little ladies in green felt hats kneeling before the holy water font or what have you. And it, it all just sort of in a, a whole different genre in their thinking. They're not thinking about reality about what is, about laws and powers and forces and energy. They're not thinking about the fact that Almighty God did all of this and He is capable. That Jesus Christ, I mean, if in our hand, if, if His hands are on you, if you are His, He is so powerful. He came back and He said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Now, I've mentioned this analogy before, but if you had a friend in the White House, who was a close personal buddy of George Bush, wouldn't you think you had something going for you? You would have possibility of talking to this friend and saying, well, please put a little thought in the ear of George Bush next time you see him and here you've got this idea you'd like to get across. You'd really probably want to keep that quiet, but most people would be unable to. They would brag about the fact that I've got a friend who is in the White House that has the ear of the president. But when you have Jesus Christ of Nazareth sitting at the right hand of God the Father who says, I have called you friends to his disciples and says, anything you ask in my name, I will do it. And it's like that he got the whole world in his hand song from way back in the 60s or whatever. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me brother in his hands. He's got you and me sister in his hands. And that is so true. We are His if we give ourselves to Him. Now, is He capable of taking care of us? Is He capable of reaching beyond this life into the grave? And are we still His even if we're dead? The Bible says over and over again, absolutely. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord of the dead and the living. So he is Lord today of Joanne Cumming, and of Woody, and of Mrs. Cunningham, and of Bill Dunham, and of so many others that we have lost. He is the Lord over every person who has died, and he is able to resurrect them. Now, 
Why would theologians want to fight and argue over that simple truth when all they got to do is shut up and wait and see? Just shut up and wait and see. Because it, what is, is. And I don't need to ask, what do you mean by the word is? It's kind of like I've said before, the, the song that uh, Doris Day used to sing, que sera, sera, that in Spanish means what will be, will be. And that's so true. That's just axiomatic. It's absolutely a true philosophical statement. What is, is, and what will be, will be. And God has decreed this is the way he's going to do it. That it is so merciful of God to allow a human being, and I want to come to a scripture on that in a moment and prove it to you. Let's just get to that while I'm thinking about that, because otherwise I might not get to it or forget it. Quote, Isaiah 57, 1 and 2. The righteous perishes, and no man lays it to heart, and merciful men are taken away, none understanding that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. You know, there are an awful lot of things that you and I would like to be spared from, having to endure, having to see. My son was telling me about a gay rights march down in Australia the other day. I happened to see on a TV channel. I won't go into all of that, but I'm telling you. Some of the stuff coming out about some of these pedophiles. And, and some old guy that is a, is a rotten, filthy, twisted pervert who has destroyed the lives of young boys and got away with it for decades and they try to cover it up. I'm telling you that there is a day of reckoning coming. But there are things that you just don't want to know about. You don't want to see. You don't want to have to listen to. You don't want it poured out just like so much vomit and garbage out of the television set every day when you turn it into the news. So it's wonderful when God says, the righteous perishes. And these were righteous, good, decent, wonderful people I'm talking about. Every one of them. They knew the truth of God. They loved it. They loved their families. They loved their brethren. They loved God. They loved the Bible. They loved the Word of God. They lived by it as best they possibly could. None, not a one of them that I've mentioned was perfect. But every one of them was a Christian. And every one of them was trying. Every one of them was working on himself or herself to overcome they were good, decent people. They were honest people. They were striving people who were trying. And they're taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Some of them have been spared from who knows what kind of horrifying things. I would far rather precede my children than to have to stand and look at a beer with the body of one of my sons or my grandchildren, far rather. There's no way I want that to happen to me. And so when I watched the light go out of my mother's eyes, I was absolutely just devastated. But yet I realized that she had been taken away from some pretty horrible things that were yet to happen, not only to her son, but to her family, to that great church, to those colleges, to so many other things that I don't know what it would have done to my mother to have seen all of that kind of thing go on. So this is a very important scripture. Let me give you another one over in Job 14, 1 to 5. Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Now, from my vast vantage point, my wife says, quit mentioning age. All right, I will. I can tell you that that is true. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. So this is Job talking about the way that we really are, that we don't last very long. And he says a little later on, verse 10, But man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost, that means expires or exhales, and where is he? As the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decays and dries up, so man lies down and rises not. Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. I can't help it that the Bible describes death as a deep, profound sleep. It just happens to be the biblical description of death. Oh, that thou would hide me in the grave, that you would keep me secret until your wrath be passed, meaning the tribulation, the heavenly sign, day of the Lord, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man die, shall he live again? 
all the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. He knew that there was a change coming from human to spirit, from physical to divine. You will call and I will answer thee. You will have a desire to the work of thine hand. Look at Job 19, 23 to 27. There's a fabulous, big, beautiful song, and I think, I'm trying to remember if it was a, I know that my sister used to sing it. I know that my Redeemer liveth. That's what I'm thinking of, and I don't think it's a part of an oratorio. I think it's a separate song. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Beautiful song. Job 19, 23 to 27. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Little did he know that they would be. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Fabulous scripture, and so absolutely true. Go to Romans 8, 28 to 39. I won't read all of this in concluding here. I know it's hard to believe this, but it is absolutely true. Verse 28, Romans 8. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. There is nothing that is a deliberate evil that Satan the devil can force upon us. There is nothing that God will allow to happen to us that eventually He will not work out for the greater good in the long term. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, to the character of his Son, to the nature of his Son, to become Christ-like, that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. He's going to be born of God eventually, as he was. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, them also he glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? You know, people trust the federal government. They just do. They just think the government can do anything. If the government would just get off the shtick and just throw enough money at it, the queers could run around oblivious and we'd get rid of AIDS. If, if they would just put, you know, about, say, well, a cool trillion or so. And all they got to do is print it, isn't it? But there are an awful lot of people that are so silly, they actually trust the federal government. It's like a little bit of idol. By the way, there is a new search for America's new idol. And all kinds of amateur girls are just giggly giggling about it and they're doing the makeup and the hair and everything and they're trying to get discovered and it's blatantly being characterized as searching for a new American idol. I thought, boy, it's wonderful to hear him telling the truth for a change. They're telling the truth for a change that that is plain idolatry. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared his own son and delivered him up for us all, spared not his own son, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? Well, I won't give you a list. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even to the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution? You know, people can be persecuted and hounded. The paparazzi hounded Diana to death. But the Bible says that that doesn't, that doesn't do anything because Jesus Christ will not forsake us even though others will. Persecution or famine or nakedness, going around trying to find a barrel to put on, or peril or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, I have preached many of these scriptures in many a funeral in the past, 
And sometimes I've noticed people's faces, and I will see some people just get more and more bitter and more sour, more angry as I preach, and others that are just kind of wide-eyed and innocent-looking. And I can always tell by who shakes my hand and who doesn't. And after the funeral, I will move over here by all the flowers are all banked up, and there is the coffin, and it's open, and there's the person lying there, and the people file by, the family last of all. And as they come by, they'll look. Some will weep. Some will touch the deceased. Some will pat his cheek. Some will just kind of look and then glance away. Some will kind of like that, I don't, like I don't want to look. And it's very interesting. I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds do this, you know, in many, many funerals that I've preached. But eventually, and I will see people who will, will come by and kind of glance at me and go on, but a lot of them will come up and warmly shake my, shake my hand. And some will say, that's the best sermon I've ever heard. That's the best you know, funeral service I've ever been to. But now and then, and then I heard outside one time people talking about, well, he's a good speaker, but I sure didn't agree with what he said. Well, I was just reading from 1 Corinthians 15 is all. I said very little. I just expounded a little bit of it. I said, 1 Corinthians 15, read it, didn't agree with what he said. That happened not that long ago where someone was standing outside, not a member of God's church, of course, that didn't agree with what I said. Kind of like Ezekiel 33. You have a lovely voice like someone who plays on an instrument. They hear your words, but they will not do them.